obtain and retain information about their environments and use that information to make behavioral decisions. Uh, this is Al Camel's uh, definition, and I actually like it a lot because it applies equally well to people and rodents and ants and robots. And so you can, um, it really is a very broad definition. But obviously the processes that Camel was talking about are mediated by nervous systems that um, vary enormously in size and complexity. And so what, let's see if I can make this go. Why can we not advance the screen here? Okay. Okay, guys, I'm having a problem uh, advancing. I can not go backwards or forwards here. Maybe I have to hit that. I have to hit that. I'll do that. Okay, sorry. Anyway, um, and as you probably know, uh, neural tissue is extremely expensive. And nevertheless, despite the huge metabolic costs of neural tissue, mammals tend to have relatively large brains com compared to their bodies, uh, body size than any other animal group. And in fact, compared to other mammals, primates have relatively large brains they have a large cortex and very sophisticated cognition. So the question of the day is, why is this? And um, primatologists have thought about this the most because their organisms are at the center of this. And um, they have developed a couple of hypotheses. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about those. The first hypothesis, which was based on observations like Jane Goodall's of um, chimpanzees developing tools to do things like um, fish for termites and open um, difficult nuts in the environment. Um, it's so it, it, intelligence supposedly evolved according to this hypothesis to actually allow the animal to figure those kinds of things out, to remember where food is, to help capture or extract food. Um, so it has a lot to do with the physical environment, but nothing to do with the social environment. And the second hypothesis, which has um, definitely come to be the most popular one with primatologists, suggests that large brains and great intelligence evolved instead to cope with complexity in the social environment. And here the, the rationale is that if you as an individual are able to anticipate um, and perhaps even manipulate the behavior of your group mates, then you can potentially avoid dangerous situations like the one I'm showing you here where this poor monkey is being hassled by two other ones. So that's the second hypothesis. And then the third, which was proposed relatively recently by Daniel Saul and colleagues is, is called the cognitive buffer hypothesis. And this hypothesis says that large brains and great intelligence evolved to allow animals to cope with novel socio-ecological challenges and thereby to enhance uh, their fitness in changing environments. As we can see, these monkeys have figured out how to cope with crossing busy roads in India. So, um, what I want to tell you is the story of our efforts to um, un understand the evolution of intelligence. And, and I'll tell you where we started. This was back, um, gee, in the very early 1990s. And uh, we had realized that our animals were rather primate-like in their social behavior. And uh, the social complexity hypothesis suggests that if the big brains found in primates were favored by social complexity, then animals living in um, primate-like societies ought to exhibit cognitive abilities and brain features that are convergent with the features that we find in primates. And so uh, we were working with spotted hyenas. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, their societies and why I believe that they are remarkably primate-like. Uh, these animals live in groups that um, range in size from you know, 10 to 20 to 130 individuals. All the animals in a clan know one another individually, and they defend a common territory, and they also rear their cubs together at a communal den. And I should just tell you as an aside that the guy to, first guy to go study them systematically in Tanzania had just come directly from Scotland. And so he was the fellow who was able to name them clans, these social groups. And the interesting thing to me about hyena clans is that they just don't look anything like the societies of any other um, mammalian carnivore you can think of, like any of these, for example. All of these other carnivores live in relatively small groups, and um, they are very closely related animals, particularly among members of the same sex. And that is just not at all what we find in spotted hyenas. In fact, spotted hyenas um, look in their societies very much like baboon troops insofar as um, the average relatedness within a hyena clan is very low because all the males change groups at some point and there's lots of males coming in from different groups. So there's a lot of gene flow, very, very low relatedness among members of different match lines within these hyena clans. We have multiple overlapping generations as we do in baboon. Uh, okay. 
Uh, we actually have overlapping generations. We have multiple adults of both sexes in the societies of both taxonomic groups. Uh, we have males departing and females spending their whole lives in their natal groups. And within the larger society, we have smaller groups that are typically composed of matrilineal kin. And most importantly, the societies are structured by hierarchical rank relationships. So in all these regards, group size, composition, and structure, um, the, the hyena societies have evolved convergently with those in, in primates. So if you want to test the hypothesis, the social complexity hypothesis uh, within the mammals, this is about your best bet because these animals are in different orders of mammals that last shared a common ancestor, something in the neighborhood of 95 million years ago. So um, we've been studying these animals in, uh, since the 1980s in the Maasai Mara National Reserve in Southwest Kenya. And this is an area, as you can see, that's open rolling grassland. It's, uh, sorry, I did that, hit that by mistake. Uh, located right near the equator of two degrees south, actually, and it's, it gets lots of sunshine, lots of grass grows, and that supports enormous numbers of mammalian herbivores, which in turn support loads of mammalian carnivores, including spotted hyenas. And we started off working with this hyena clan indicated here in pink, and had, are, these days, the last several years, we've been working with all six of these social groups in uh, the Maasai Mara. And we recognize each individual in each of our social groups by a pattern of unique spots and ear damage and often other physical marks as well, like this guy, you would certainly never mistake this guy for any other hyena. And we spend several hours every day sitting in cars like this one to which the hyenas are very well habituated because most of them have actually just grown up with the car sitting in their environment um, and us watching the animals. And one of the things that we've recorded very religiously since the study began is every single occasion of interactions like the one I'm showing you here. And what's going on here is that Cochise is an adult female and she's lunging up out of this hole at Oliver Twist, another adult female, my apologies. And Oliver Twist is really just interested in Cochise's little black baby who she's just brought to the communal den. But Cochise is being defensive of her cub and she's lunging up out of this hole at Oliver Twist. And you can see from Oliver Twist's reaction that she is exhibiting appeasement behavior. Her ears are plastered back, her eyes are squinting to protect them, her tails down between her legs, and all these ways, you know, their body language is very similar to what we find in cats and dogs. But because Oliver Twist is exhibiting appeasement behavior in response to Cochise's aggression, we've, we, we actually refer to Oliver Twist as the loser in this fight and Cochise as the winner. So because we now, we've recorded every one of those since the study began, we have tens of thousands of those in our database, and that allows us for any given time period in the study to create a very crystal clear picture of what the society looks like. And so here I'm showing you an example of that. Got about two or three years worth of interactions here. And I've taken out 50 hyenas between Bailey and Midget. And what I'm showing you is obviously a dominance hierarchy where we've ranked all these individuals in the society from Murphy who can win against everyone else in the society down to, I don't know why it keeps flipping around, Boston who actually is the lowest ranking member of the entire group and he can't win against anyone else. And the very same individuals are indicated as losers up along the top axis and the numbers in the matrix then represent the number of interactions we've seen where there was a clear winner and a clear loser. Uh, and this looks very much like um, what you'd find in a troop of baboons. There are very few fight outcomes like these that are inconsistent with the rank orderings we have assigned. And the big difference between hyenas and baboons is that in hyena society, it's the adult females who are at the top of the hierarchy and the breeding males who are at the bottom. The reverse is true in baboons, obviously, because males are much bigger and stronger, and so they are socially dominant. And what we found is that matrilines have ranks as well as individuals. So here are the individuals over on the right here, and these are all in blue, members of the alpha matriline. It tends to be the largest because they have the best access to food, so they reproduce fastest. Then the beta match line, all their members are ranked concurrently adjacent to one another. And then all the way down to the last lowest ranked match line and below them are all the immigrant males who have come in from elsewhere to breed. And then the last thing I think I need to tell you is a little bit about hyenas life history. Uh, these animals give birth at an isolated natal den and they keep their cubs at the natal den for uh, typically three or four weeks and their litters are very small, only one or two cubs. And then they pick them up in their jaws and carry them to the clan's communal den. And I'm showing you a picture of a communal den scene down here. The communal dens tend to be the social hub of the clan's territory. And everybody comes there to meet the new cubs and remind them that they're members of this clan as well. And the cubs spend typically about 10 months at the communal den. They start traveling around the home range with their moms. 
and uh, later on their own. And uh, eventually, on, on average, at about 14 months, they get weaned. And then at 24 months, they go through puberty. And after that, females start breeding depending on their social ranks because high ranking ones eat more so they can start breeding at younger ages, as I'll show you. And then 100%, almost 100% of males disperse after puberty. And if they're lucky, they become socially integrated into uh, another clan and <clears throat> may be able to actually breed there. And the longest individuals of both sexes, that, that the longest lifespans for both males and females in our study area has been 26 years so far. Okay, what I want to show you here is um, the nature of hyena society. In this respect, it differs from baboon society insofar as whereas baboons are all together in one place almost 100% of the time, spotted hyenas live in what's referred to as a fission fusion society. So here I'm showing you um, the data on, on locations of six collared females, all of whom are generating fixes at um, really one second intervals. And you're looking at an area about 75 square kilometers and you can see that sometimes these animals are all together in one place. The den is right in here during this period, but they also go off alone and typically to forage. Like you find magenta here, this pink animal goes way off in the periphery to forage all by herself. And so they're separated by tens of kilometers. So um, it's a really interesting situation. And what they live in these groups to solve ecological problems. And the big problems that come up in hyena society because they live in these open areas are um, resource acquisition and defense. And so um, spotted hyenas need their group mates in order to maintain their territory. What you're showing down here in the bottom left is a, a, one, one, ha, one team in a clan war. So at territorial boundaries, we often have big teams of hyenas that actually go back and forth over the boundary and fight over it. And if they win, they can actually ex expand their territories. And they also um, use help from their group mates in terms of securing uh, food uh, and also chasing away lions from their food. And then when they want to eat, they avoid uh, within group competition by going off alone to hunt. That's the typical scenario in hyena society. We know that um, just as in monkeys, uh, hyena social rank is learned. It's not inherited. And we know this because we actually administered what we euphemistically referred to as bone tests. Um, and here, what we're really doing is providing a whole roadkill gazelle to these cubs, the whole clan, a whole group of cubs pouring out of this den hole back here, racing over here, because even though they're all still nursing, they really love meat and they'll fight over it just like adults do. What we're trying to do is simulate the competitive feeding situation that we see every day in adult hyenas as shown down here in the bottom right. But you can see these kids are racing over here. They're so excited and they'll fight over the food. And then you can actually see who wins based on wins and losses, just like in that big dominance hierarchy I showed you the, um, re just a, a few minutes ago. And um, what we find is that when you give these the animals in this cohort, this was our, our largest tested cohort. So we had 13 cubs here and we tested them first when they'd only been at the, at the communal den for um, one to two months. And you can see in the left-hand panel of this, we're plotting their social rank mates on wins and losses just in this bone test. And there aren't any adults or older hyenas present because we end the test as soon as one of those animals shows up. So it's just the cubs. This is just their peer group. And we're um, looking at this relationship to maternal rank down here. This is their mother's ranks. So high rank by, by convention among primatologists is one, that's the highest rank down to the big numbers represent low social ranks. And you can see on this left panel that these look like, these data points look like scrambled eggs. There's no relationship there at all, um, but they learn. And uh, a few months later, you can see that their ranks are becoming really nicely isomorphic with the ranks of their moms um, in only a few months. And as in monkeys, we find that patterns of resource competition um, outcomes are determined by social rank. And so as in uh, monkeys, the low ranking individuals, in this case, these three guys who aren't feeding um, are having to wait their turns in this hierarchical queue to get access to that buffalo that's lying there. And uh, this rank related variation in food access has really profound consequences for reproduction among females. Here I'm showing you two different indicators of reproductive success in female hyenas, the number of offspring produced per year. And you can see that the high ranking ones are producing a lot of relatively large number of cubs per year and the low ranking ones are not. And here, down here, we're looking at the age at which spotted hyena females first give birth. And so here's the daughter of our alpha female right here. And way over here is the daughter of our um, lowest ranked female. And she gives birth for the first time at 72 months compared to giving birth for the first time when this, this alpha daughter is less than two and a half years old. So we see they're, they're breeding for longer because they start breeding earlier and they produce more cubs per unit time. And those, those differences 
have profound long-term fitness consequences. And I wanna show you those here. So what you're looking at is the representation among the adult females present in our original study clan that are descended from the original 19 females that Lawrence Frank found there in 1979 when he first started working with this population. And so these are decade long intervals that you're seeing here from 1979 to 2019. And what you can see is whereas K-Butt was only one of 19 females represented back here in 1979, today her female um, descendants occupy 60%, almost 60% of the rank positions occupied by females. And there are only descendants of four matrilines surviving here uh, 40 years later. So what we're seeing is these gray triangles representing extinctions of entire matrilines. So it really pays to be high ranking in hyena society if you possibly can as in monkey society. So in all these respects, spotted hyenas have a lot in common with monkeys and their group size and composition and structure. We've talked about life history patterns and social development, uh, rank determines priority of access to resources and um, fitness the fitness consequences of social rank are profound. Are there also similarities then in social cognition between these taxa? That was the question we posed. And I'm gonna summarize about 20 years worth of work in a couple of slides. The, the short answer is yes, um, they are remarkably convergent. Uh, we know that just as in monkeys, um, spotted hyenas can recognize each other using vision, olfaction, or, or audition. Uh, they actually apologize, if you will. They reconcile after fights, which humans and other animals do to repair damaged social relationships. Uh, they actually engage in kin-biased associations, and they exhibit a lot of nepotistic behavior, just like monkeys. And interestingly, even though neither uh, male monkeys or male, at least old world monkeys, uh, as well as spotted hyena males don't participate in paternal care. Nevertheless, spotted hyenas can recognize their paternal kin as well as maternal kin, just as baboons can. And I want to just give you a very quick idea of how we find these things out in the field, because um, this is uh, where the animals live. And um, it's coolest, I think, to study them in nature, just like Doc Storm thought. So here we're administering a, a playback experiment to a, sing a female back here. Um, and she's about 100 meters from the car. We've got these speakers here. And what we're playing are distress vocalizations of a cub. And it might be her cub, and it might be somebody else's cub. Um, and we played this to a lot of different hyenas. And we get differential responses. So we actually, here we're measuring the time spent looking at the speaker, which IE is basically at our car. But then they don't just look. They actually engage for a long time, sometimes half an hour of searching for this distressed cub after the playback. And I think what you can see pretty straightforwardly here is that if you're not related to the distressed cub, you don't waste any time looking for it. So um, it is really pretty remarkable how uh, relatedness uh, influences interactions in this species. Uh, there are other similarities, whereas um, spotted hyenas like monkeys actually form coalitions and do other things where they join forces to accomplish social goals and other kinds of goals. They actually recognize third party relationships based on both rank and kinship. So third party relationship is just where I'm looking at two other individuals and I know their relationship, even though they're not related to me directly. Uh, hyenas also, like monkeys, track a lot of information about their social environments and use that to make adaptive social decisions. Um, we, they keep track, for example, of who's present in, the, in an audience, who's present in their immediate environment, and that, that affects whether or not they participate in various kinds of social interactions. And finally, they recognize that social partners vary in their relative value and choose accordingly. And what we've been doing over the years is going along behind the primatologists, and they develop a new method for asking, okay, you know, can you, these monkey species, actually perform this particular feat of um, social cognition? And so every single question that we've asked the hyenas of this sort, the answer has been yes, they can do all these very same things that monkeys do. And let me just give you an example of this last point here where they're recognizing that other social partners have differential value to them. Here, this is uh, Mikhail Zickman's lovely work um, from her dissertation where she's looking at the association indices, just it's a measure of how, how much time two individuals spend together between adult females in the society and adult immigrant males. And I should tell you that adult immigrant males initiate 100% of these interactions because females appear not to be able to care less about what males are hanging around with them. They're only interested in them you know, one day a year, basically, or every couple of years. And what you can see though, is that the males clearly understand that these are the females to hang out with here. And they like to spend a lot more time with these females than they do with these females. 
and we have no idea how males know what the relative ranks are of the female hyenas, but it's in any case, it's an adaptive decision because you can see that if, if the animals who hang out with these females tend to mate with them and the females who are in the top two thirds of the hierarchy, their offspring survive a lot better than the lower ranked females that the males don't particularly like to hang out with. So here's what I wanna summarize so far. We just are, have found striking similarities in social cognition between spotted hyenas and Cercopithecine primates, and um, all the behavioral data so far support the social complexity hypothesis. And this, this prompted us to think about the brain. Well, what is the brain also convergently evolved with monkey brains? And this is work spearheaded by my colleague, Charlene Sakai, and um, she's actually uh, testing effectively what's called the social brain hypothesis, which is simply the social complexity hypothesis applied to nervous systems instead of behavior. Um, and what we ought to see is that the parts of the brains that mediate social behavior ought to be expanded in both groups. And in fact, it is. But you can see that here's a baboon brain and here's hyena brain down here. And you can see that they're really um, pretty different. This looks a lot like our brains where um, the neuroscientists call pretty much everything anterior to the central sulcus to be frontal cortex. And the, uh, the homologue of the, cent uh, of the central sulcus in carnivore brains is this teeny little dimple, the post-cruciate dimple. And carnivore brains, in contrast to monkey brains, have a big olfactory bulb at the front. And so we defined a frontal cortex as everything anterior to this, this big crevasse, which is the cruciate sulcus. So everything between this sulcus and that, that olfactory bulb is, is we're going to consider to be anterior cerebrum or frontal cortex. So Charlene, what she was able to do was use mimic software to put skulls of spotted hyenas and lots of other species into a CT scanner. And then she takes the slices, um, the computer slices that the CT makes and puts them all together to create a three-dimensional virtual brain. And then you can actually measure the area, the volume of each of those areas. And so what she's doing is um, starting off to look at the brain regions and brain size in spotted hyenas compared to their closest relatives, which are three other species of hyenid. And what Charlene is able to do is we can divide the brain into four crude parts. The olfactory bulbs up here, anterior cerebrum, most of which is frontal cortex, uh, posterior cerebrum, and the uh, brainstem cerebellum area. And um, the, the only surviving hyenas, there were once many of them in the Miocene roaming the earth, but today we have only four species remaining. Um, the aardwolf is a tiny little diminutive hyena uh, about the size of a beagle, and it um, actually uh, lose solitarily except when it's mating and it survives entirely on termites. It eats termites exclusively. And this hard wolf is the last descendant of what was once a very large clade of what are called dog-like hyenas. And they didn't have the bone cracking morphology in their skulls that these other surviving hyenas have today. And the, the striped brown and spotted hyena are all members of a bone cracking clade uh, but they have different types of society. So br br brown and striped hyenas live in very small groups. Um, brown hyenas can live in clans in Southern Africa up to, containing up to 11 individuals. And striped hyenas typically will um, have two or three females sharing dens and having their cubs at the den together. So it's an incipient form of sociality um, on the path, I suppose, to the kinds of society that we see in spotted hyenas. But spotted hyenas remain the only living hyena that are adapted to um, their postcranial anatomy is adapted for cur uh, cursorial hunting of vertebrate prey, and they're the only hyenas that live in these big, complicated social groups. So what, we're, what I'm showing you here in two dimensions is what um, Charlene's project set out to do in three, um, comparing this uh, overall brain size and frontal cortex area among um, different uh, types of hyenas. And here I'm showing you two solitary carnivores with their relatively small frontal cortex, and then uh, two larger carnivores, two social carnivores with their larger uh, frontal cortex. And if the social complexity hypo hypothesis is correct, then we should see um, this, this frontal cortex volume increasing as we go, decreasing, sorry, as we go down from spotted hyenas through brown and striped hyenas to the aardwolf leading its solitary existence. And in fact, um, we get some pretty interesting results. So here's the overall endocranial volume over here, and this is the spotted hyena. And here are the other three hyena species. So this is not exactly conform to the predictions of the social complexity hypothesis. But this, this, this anterior cerebrum volume over here certainly appears to, where you have spotted hyenas with the largest, then brown and striped hyenas in the middle, and um, the solitary aardwolf down here. But bear in mind, this is also consistent with the hypothesis, the physical complexity hypothesis, because spotted hyenas 
are the only ones to eat live prey. These two species both survive on carrion and this species eats termites. And here's, here's one result from that same study that I can't think of any other way to explain other than um, a real um, difference in uh, anterior cerebrum size. So you can see that we, we had a lot of spotted hyena specimens. And so we, um, these are all adults and we ran them to find that the cells, uh, the overall endocranial volume doesn't differ significantly between uh, males and females, but the size of the frontal cortex does. And um, that's, I can't think of any other reason why males would have a larger frontal cortex than females, because both males and females in spotted hyena society need to be efficient hunters. They have to be equally aware of their environment, but their social lives are, are very different because male spotted hyenas, as I mentioned, don't, stay, don't spend their lives in their natal groups like females. Females just learn a cast of characters when, they, when they're growing up and that's it. They don't have to learn anything else the whole life. The um, males move to a new, a new study area, a new, a new clan where they actually need to learn at least one new cast of characters and potentially even a second one if they disperse again later on. But the executive functions of frontal cortex are, are these, the most important ones, which is the ability to shift between tasks or mental states, monitoring and updating working memory representations and inhibition of dominant or prepotent responses. And I'm going to come back to that because we start messing towards the end of this uh, work with hyenas trying to understand the evolution of general intelligence. And so um, that is where I'm headed with this. But um, in terms of the comparative brain analysis, what we found is that whole brain and frontal cortex are both larger in spotted hyenas than less gregarious hyena species. And the frontal cortex in male is um, larger than it is in female spotted hyenas. So to so far, both the more behavioral and morphological data support the social complexity hypothesis. Okay, but uh, the, the social complexity hypothesis, you know, looks, has a pretty big problem, which is it can't really explain how it is species with high socio-cognitive abilities are also um, excelling in general intelligence. And that's non-social intelligence, just all the other aspects of intelligence that you might need other than dealing with your group mates. So here are how our three hypotheses would explain evolution of, of general intelligence. Uh, the first one would simply suggest that general um, intelligence evolves as a side effect of selection favoring cognitive abilities that allow animals to cope effectively with the physical environment. The second hypothesis similarly argues that it's a side effect, but it's selection for favored, favoring social cognitive abilities rather than um, abilities to cope with physical environments. And then finally, the cognitive buffer hypothesis actually is quite different insofar as it, it actually um, proposes that there is a direct selection favoring individuals with greater general intelligence because those are the individuals who are going to um, be able to cope most effectively with environmental change. But um, I want to bring this out and just give you a, a, a sort of silly example, but I think one that makes the point quite well of the differential behavioral flexibility between baboons and creatures like spotted hyenas. Um, social problem solving is remarkably similar as we've seen in both hyenas and baboons, yet behavioral plasticity is enormously greater in baboons. And um, the silly example shows you what I mean. So these baboons, this is a car that's visiting a park in, in Southern Africa, and these baboons are, are curious and they figured out not only how to get into that rooftop carrier but they've also dismantled it and taken apart everything and um, they're sorting through all the possessions there much apparently to the horror of the lady in the front seat. By contrast hyenas uh, really have a, 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 a marked inability to do what baboons can do. Let me show you. My students and I sleep every single night in little canvas and screen boxes in, out in the middle of nowhere. And we know from looking at the dust around our tents that there is um, lion activity out there, hyena activity and leopard activity um, most nights right outside our tent. And we, we sleep with the tents just like you see them here. The screens are open and um, the screens are closed but the doors are open. And the hyenas can look in and see us and smell us and hear us. And yet somehow they can't associate us with being a possible food source. Um, and that's pretty amazing because they have the equipment you can see in these teeth. If a hyena could view you as a food source, he could just walk right in there and eat you. But you are remarkably safe sleeping there in the, in the bush at night. And a, a multi-million dollar safari industry counts on hyenas and other carnivores not being able to figure out how to get into your tent 
to eat you. But if you left a banana or a, an apple on the bed in here, the baboons would break into that tent in a heartbeat. We know because we've sewed up, sewed up so many tents over the years of people, idiot guests, leaving their fruit on their beds. Anyway, the baboons go right in. So this brings us to the question of, well, okay, how does this general intelligence evolve? How do you get greater behavioral flexibility? And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about a study that Eli Swanson, shown here, did, where he was actually looking at uh, the brains and brain regions uh, in, in a lot of different carnivores using the same techniques that Charlene used in her analysis of the hyenas. So he's using brain size here as a proxy for general intelligence. And he actually um, used data from CT scans of brains of all of these 36 species. And we had multiple specimens of each species. Uh, we had the endocranial measurements plus you know, we know each of the volumes of their brain areas as, as calculated for the hyenas. Uh, we know uh, from the literature about their social complexity, their diet, their life history, and, and their sex. So um, what Eli found was that um, there are enormous differences between the various families of mammalian carnivores in terms of how big their brains are. But it doesn't have anything to do with how social you are. So here we're looking at these seven families, and we've got mustelids. This is the weasel family, raccoon family, bear family, dog family, cat family, hyena family, and the mongoose family. And uh, we use two different correction factors here. Um, most people, when they do this kind of calculation, just take an average mass of each sex from the literature and correct with the mass. That's what we've done in the white bars here. The black, the, sorry, the gray bars are actually correcting for the size of the skull from which that brain actually came, which we think is a better measure, frankly, but it really doesn't matter. You can actually still see that the biggest brains occur in the weasel family and the bear family. Um, by far, and all of those animals are almost always solitary. One thing that came out of this that, that supports the um, physical complexity hypothesis is this. We find that diet has a big effect on um, brain volume, and so far as carnivores, carnivorous carnivores are uh, ones who eat uh, live animal prey, or have the biggest brains, then omnivores like raccoons and bears, and then um, uh, insect eaters. So apparently you don't need to have a big brain to eat bugs. So what we started to do was to ask hyenas, okay, well, we know that you're very, very good at social cognition, but how, how well do you do at solving non-social problems? So um, we designed a very simple puzzle box right after Edward Thorndike's 1898 um, tests. Um, we, did, we presented this box. It's made out of wrought iron, weighs about 75 pounds. Anything else the hyenas can just crush with their teeth. And instead of um, making a box that the animal has to figure out how to get out of, we actually just put a chunk of meat inside the box and the animal has to figure out to slide this bolt from right to left and then the door will swing open. And they can do this with their paws, with their mouth, they can just bash the box around, whatever they wanna do. And we performed um, 354 trials on 59 individuals from three different study clans. And here's what we found. We actually found that only nine of 59 wild subjects ever opened the box. And Sarah Benson Amram, whose dissertation work um, this comes from, actually was interested to find out, well, what predicts whether you're going to be able to open the box or not? And three things turned out to be important. First, the number of behaviors that the animal tried when it first interacts with the box is a good predictor of whether or not it's going to get in ever. So here the animals exhibit a lot of behaviors, get in, the ones that don't, never manage to. Then the animals who are more persistent, who spend more time working to solve the problem, are, do better at opening it. And finally, the ones who are not afraid of novel objects um, are also the ones likeliest to get it. So um, we were stunned at how few hyenas actually managed to open this thing. So we went to our friends who run the captive hyena colony at UC Berkeley, and we tested 19 of their captive animals, where we found that um, captive animals are pretty much um, mostly could actually open the box pretty straightforwardly. And we suspect that the difference between the wild and the captive ones is simply that the wild guys are actually on a clock. They can't screw around and spend too much time trying to solve a new problem if they've got tried and true ways of, of feeding themselves and so forth. They gotta move on and get to business. And also captive animals obviously have a lot more experience with man-made metal objects than wild hyenas. But what this prompted us to do was to think we might like to look at this particular problem in a larger array of species. So I had a student who wanted to do a zoo project and he went around to nine different zoos in North America and tested uh, the ability to open a puzzle box uh, of all these different species here. And here are the uh, in species that we tested and often multiple individuals per species, but we tested 153 individuals from 41 species in nine different carnivore families. And um, you, as you can imagine, it's difficult to do work in multiple zoos and have uh, conditions be comparable. 
Um, but to do this, um, I used to work in a zoo and um, we simply went to the keepers of each individual carnivore in each zoo and says, okay, there's Larry the tiger. What does Larry's, what is Larry's favorite food? And those keepers, they know these things because they need to know what the animal's favorite treats are so that they can get their husbandry goals accomplished and move the animals around between enclosures and so forth. So these favorite foods of various mammalian carnivores varied from a baby goat uh, to honey, uh, here's a, a chunk of meat, uh, mealworms, bamboo, whatever the animal wanted. That's what we put in the thing. And then we tested them all in their home uh, enclosure and we used boxes of multiple sizes to um, make it more or less you know, the same relative size for each tested species. And so what we would do to, to test these animals is have the keeper take the animal out of the enclosure for a few minutes. We set up the box with the door facing the camera, film the whole thing, keeper lets the animal back in, and then the, the animal has a half an hour either to open the box or give up and just mope around in the enclosure. And what we're able to do is um, ask about success opening the box in relationship to those three uh, performance measures that Sarah Benson Amram identified as being important. And also from the literature, information on their sociality, body size, their manual dexterity, and neuroanatomy. And uh, what I want to do here is just sort of show you what this looks like. So um, some of these uh, video clips come from animals who are on their first trials. Uh, others come from animals who are um, having subsequent trials. This is a bintrong who's going to be able to get a fish out of that box. It's a civet relative that lives in Asia. There's a brown bear. Success. Here's a quadamundi. I gotta tell you, these experiments are so much fun. A lot of animals, especially canids, did a lot of digging so that we're gonna get them into the box. There's an Arctic box. Polar bear. Black bear. Snow leopard. This is our first trial. Not a very effective way to get into the box. Then here's a subsequent trial. Figured it out. I should tell you that our original objective was to actually develop learning curves for each of these species, but keeper patients gave out way before we got there. This is a striped hyena who never does, no striped hyena ever managed to open the box, even though they were very beautiful. Spotted hyena. It's a badger. This one's sort of cute because this animal opens the box by accident and doesn't even realize it for a second. It's got a bowl of mealworms in there. Water. There was one keeper who insisted that we use smaller boxes than we thought was appropriate for this species and this species, but otherwise it all looked pretty well. And finally, <coughs> the wolverine. 
So it's never been clear to me what that Wolverine wants to do with that box in its water trough. That doesn't work, so it gives up and gets a to-go package. Okay, so um, these are all the species that we tested. Um, the bolded ones here have at least one individual who successfully opened the box. And uh, gray ones are one species that no individual ever successfully opened the box. Uh, we found an unsurprising result that brain size increases with body mass. But most importantly, um, we actually found that their social species weren't performing any better in this um, test than solitary species. So what we've been doing um, well, let me just summarize here. So we're actually clearly seeing convergent evolution of social problem solving, and perhaps also with respect to the size of specific brain regions that requires more study, of course. Um, but the social complexity hypothesis alone can't explain brain size or the ability to solve non-social problems. So this leaves the evolution of general intelligence unexplained for the time being. So what we um, set out to do was to um, directly test the cognitive buffer hypothesis, which I'll remind you um, suggests that general intelligence evolved to allow animals to cope with novel socio-ecological challenges. And so we're actually using urbanization as a form of evolutionary novelty to which hyenas have been exposed. And um, that is the case that in Northern Ethiopia, there are a number of cities, including this one, the city of Mikele, Ethiopia, which contains um, roughly 800 hyenas living with 300,000 humans, and this has been going on for over 500 years. So this is a really long-term urbanized population. The people in northern Ethiopia believe that spotted hyenas eat evil spirits, and so they're very tolerant of them. The hyenas all forage in um, the dumps around uh, Mikele, but um, we're actually testing cognition in hyenas across an urbanization gradient to try to understand whether the cognitive buffer hypothesis can explain general intelligence. And so we've got three different study areas, one that's remarkably pristine, just like the hyenas habitat was in the Pleistocene. Uh, we've got a rapidly urbanizing area at the edge of, of one of the parks that we work in. And then we've got this um, city of Mikele, Ethiopia. You can see the hyenas here waiting at the butcher shop for handouts in Mikele. And so what we've been doing is trying to administer IQ tests to hyenas using all these different types of apparatus. We're testing learning, memory, behavioral flexibility, executive function, and so forth. And then instead of calculating IQ, we're going to uh, calculate the animal equivalent, which is called G, using um, a psychometric factor analytic approach. And we also can calculate selection gradients on G in each habitat. So um, what what we ought to see if the cognitive buffer hypothesis is correct is that these animals in the rapidly urbanizing area should have higher G and selection gradient. Uh, the selection gradient on G should be highest here in Talic, but that is not what's happening. Uh, we see that the city hyenas, the er McKelly ones, um, do very badly, uh, and the Talic hyenas don't do much better, and the best uh, performing hyenas in this test were at Serena. Um, so, so far we have no support for the cognitive buffer hypothesis, but then in the meantime, there's been a pandemic and a civil war in Ethiopia. So uh, we're hoping to get back there eventually. But instead of more um, cognitive buffer uh, information, we actually have managed to find more, even more support for the social complexity hypothesis, which is, this is work that Lily Johnson Ulrich has done for her PhD, where she's uh, applying this particular, uh, um, it's a test of inhibitory control. It's basically a modified detour test. So the animal is trained first on this opaque tube in which we've cut holes so that odors can escape. And then we put a chunk of meat in here and the hyena very quickly learns to come around the end of it and pick the meat out from the side. Um, and then um, once it's reached learning criteria here, which is five successful trials, then we present it with a, a clear plex plexiglass tube with the same holes cut in it. And what hyenas typically do, as do infant humans and most animals when they're first tested in this way, is they, they walk right into the clear plastic trying to get at the meat. And they have to learn again um, to inhibit that response and go around the end like they did. And what Lily found, interestingly, was she, she tested cognition in, in these four study plans and found that um, the probability of passing one of these trials increased with clan overall clan size. But the even a more interesting result to me was um, that here are Cubs can grow up in cohorts ranging from you, the lone cub, to 20 or 25 cubs. And so um, Lily actually looked at 
the effect of cohort size on your ability to solve this inhibitory control problem and found a, a really strikingly strong relationship. So overall, I'd like to conclude that we got a lot of behavioral and morphological support for the social complexity hypothesis, particularly you know, social cognition and frontal cortex are enhanced in spotted hyenas as they are in monkeys, and group size is correlated with inhibitory control, as I just showed you there towards the end. Um, there is some support for the physical complexity hypothesis, particularly in the form of um, how diet influences intelligence. And by the way, none of these hypotheses are mutually exclusive, so it doesn't surprise us that multiple things might be going on. But we ha haven't found any support at all to date for the cognitive buffer hypothesis. And I will leave it there and uh, be happy to take any questions. These are all the wonderful people who helped collect the data. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. And you'll have to imagine our roar of applause because <laughs> we're not in the room together, unfortunately. Um, well, so this would be a good time to put questions in Q&A if you have any for Kay, and those can range from what it's like to work in the field in Masai Mara and other places to um, the, the content she was talking about. Uh, and why pe while people um, type or raise hands, raising hands is an option too. Um, I have a question to start us off, Kay. Um, I was really struck by that figure that you showed of um, the matrilineal um, diversity and how it's really decreased over time. Uh, and it looked like by quite a bit. And I was curious if you have insight into either, you know, environmental or other kinds of factors that might be contributing to that. Um, it was clear that the dominant ones are the ones that have persisted, but why do you think the diversity has decreased so much? Well, um, I actually think that, um, you know, there's, there, there maintains a lot of diversity in, in the genetic structure of the population just because these males are all changing groups. So I, I don't think there's been an overall decline in, in terms of genetic diversity within the population. Um, but, um, you know, you saw that there are a couple of low ranking metro lines that have managed to stay alive over 40 years, despite the fact that they're, you know, not high ranking at all. And that suggests to me that th there's either serendipity or some sort of um, um, mothering skills that um, might function importantly here to help females, even in the low ranking lineages, um, you know, perpetuate their metro lines over time. I don't know if somebody, I think, just unmuted for a moment. But um, so in, I, I know in the in some other animal societies, you have these kind of different strategies in the males, you know, of like the dominant uh, one and then more of like the sneaker um, strategy. So do, do you see that in the females? Since the females are, are uh, I guess, the deciding sex here for reproductive opportunities and, and the dominant sex. Do you see that even even in those subordinate females? Yeah, you know, the subordinate females are forced to make the best of a bad situation. If they try to go off on their own, they stand absolutely no chance at all of having any reproductive success. And I think the reason for that is because in this kind of open habitat that you can see behind me, um, the lions or other hyenas can see what you've just killed from miles and miles away. And without buddies, you're not going to be able to defend your kill. And so what we find is that low ranking females typically go off to the edges of the clan's territory or even far from it to go foraging so they don't be bothered by higher ranking individuals and they can at least have a few minutes alone with a carcass because a hyena can consume, you know, something like 15 kilos of food in 20 minutes. I mean, it's fantastic how much, how much they can ingest in record time. So if you got a few minutes alone, you can actually eat a lot of willoughbys. Yeah, that's amazing. That's an amazing number. <laughs> I don't doubt it watching uh, my dog eat as like, I think my dog is very subordinate and she, you know, does it, inhales her food. And, and I, I always oftentimes wonder if it has to do with her, her rank. <laughs> um, okay, well, there's lots of questions coming in now. So, um, I just Sue asked, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll read them out loud because I think the audience can't see these. So, <laughs> I am curious as to how a female's dominance might shift seasonally with reproduction. Does her position decline by the time young are weaned and her condition may be lower than prior to reproduction? Um, no, we don't see any change in rank relationships based on the phase a female's in and her reproductive cycle at all. Um, 
you know, when females are no longer tied to the den, no longer have cubs there, they can stop being central place foragers and go back to foraging, you know, wherever they want. So the, having cubs at the den definitely restricts your movements to some extent, but females in the Serengeti commute 45 kilometers back and forth every few days to, you know, when the migration's far from their particular den and, you know, the cubs gain and lose weight while the mothers are, they lose weight while the mothers are away and then gain a lot when the mothers come back. But, um, you know, high ranking females need to do that less than low ranking ones do, of course, but um, there's no phase of reproduction that, uh, you know, where rank changes. Um, thanks. And then uh, let's see, there's a another one. I'm looking for kind of similar content questions real quick. So Bob Mason asked for the sex difference in anterior cortices. Could it have to do with processing information from olfaction? And a sub question, do the males need to identify high ranking females, uh, sorry, by odor cues? Do they even have a choice or is it all run by the females? Well, who, who actually gets to mate is always a female's decision. Uh, there's no coercive sex in this species at all, given the female's bizarre uh, genitalia. Um, but, um, okay, sorry, can you just read the beginning of that again? I missed it. That's not in my um, chat, so I'm not seeing that one. Uh, yeah, I think, hang on, it went to the answer, so let me go click to that again. Uh, so for the sex differences in the anterior uh, cortices, yeah, could it have to do with processing information from olfaction? Yeah, I don't, I don't see why not, because, you know, like uh, other mammalian carnivores, olfaction is a tremendously important sense for these animals. And um, I'd be surprised if there, if there wasn't, if olfaction didn't have something to do with the male's ability to discriminate um, females and, and rank. And I suspect that, you know, the families contain um, slightly different bacterial colonies in their scent glands. And so it, it's quite conceivable that there are family odors as well as we know there are clan odors, so that the different clans smell differently based on their bacterial um, communities in their scent glands. But um, we actually just know so little about olfaction in general in these animals that it's certainly possible. But, um, but they're also able to recognize one another very straightforwardly, you know, using visual cues and just listening to their voices. Okay, we have a few students who have asked, uh, what kind of education do you recommend to get into your career, and how long did it take you to get to do the field studies like you do now? Well, um, in terms of education, um, I, I, if this sounds interesting to you, I strongly, uh, you know, advise you to try and get some experience doing field work, and there are, you know, loads, loads of people who actually need helpers. Um, Sometimes you get paid for that. Sometimes the, the person who needs the help doesn't actually have enough money and will ask you to pay to do it. But um, there are opportunities to go do that. And as an undergraduate at a place like um, Oregon State, you should be able to get research experience in the lab of, you know, one or more of your professors. And um, that's tremendously important when I look at prospective students to, to take to Kenya with me, you know, how, how seriously do they understand what's involved in research? Because a lot of people have a OG oh, whiz, it's beautiful National Geographic kind of view of field work, but there's in fact a lot of digging yourself out of the mud and, uh, you know, fending off annoying baboons in your camp who want to eat your breakfast and those kinds of things that, um, you know, not everyone finds equally palatable to deal with. But, you know, do, do as well as you can, have a, as high an undergraduate GPA as you can, get research experience and, and, and volunteer or get a, a low paying job as a field assistant for a summer and see how that does. There's RU programs, research experience for undergraduate programs all over the country that actually a lot of those involve field work. And so, um, you know, I would look into those. Indiana University has a big site where they routinely have summer RU opportunities for students. So you might want to check that out. Thank you, Kay. So uh, I think, well, I think we should answer a few more questions and then maybe we could move over to the social and, and people could keep asking questions there. Um, so uh, Julia Madison asks, the differences in G for the wild urban uh, populations were pretty impressive. Is it possible this might be the result of dietary effects on intelligence or other physiological connections between environment and brain function? Yeah, I think that's that's a very um, a very good suggestion because um, you know we know from looking at these animals in in the city in Ethiopia, they've been foraging on trash for so long they don't really need their buddies anymore to forage on trash because it's all pretty particulate you know so they're feeding on little things they don't need cooperative hunting they don't need cooperative resource defense at least not that we've seen 
although there are occasionally clan wars in in those cities. Um, but you know, we've we've done this. Lily had a student who recently was um, actually using photographs to um, measure the the shoulder height of urban hyenas versus the ones that we work with in the Mara, and they're very short. I think there's been lack of selection on limb length because these animals don't have to run to chase living prey like the animals behind me do. So I actually think that's that's a really you know interesting suggestion, and I think there might be something to it, but we don't know for sure. Awesome. Yeah, that was, there was a second person who also had a question about diet. So I think hopefully that uh, answered that question as well. So um, we have another attendee, Connor, who says, uh, great talk. I look at zebrafish behavior to understand toxic effects. What things do you consider when creating behavioral assays? How do you create an appropriate level of difficulty? Well, that's a good question. Um, and we've actually erred. Uh, you know, we've created some apparatuses that were way too difficult for the task, you know, for, for our animals. And so then we had to rethink altogether because if you get a, a problem that only one individual out of a hundred can solve, you know, it's gonna be years before you have enough information to, to move forward. So we have had to simplify. That's one reason we actually use those, um, those cylinders, for example, and, you know, the, um, innovation box that we've studied you know those are simple things that you know they have to be sturdy but um they're simple and so you know you can get a lot of animals figuring them out eventually but not not all so anyway yeah it's um when i'm trying to develop an assay you know we want it to be um not scary to the animals make it attractive to them so that they'll want to participate in the studies because you know, all these animals are participating in our cognition trials totally of their own volition. Nobody's making them do this. Uh, they're just interested. So, um, you know, we've got to have something that elicits interest in the animals and um, we need to find a reward that um, works. And Lily was using chunks of meat, but we go to the butcher once a week. And by the end of the week, we're talking about meat that really doesn't smell that great in the car with you. It's just pretty awful. So, you know, we've discovered that um, full cream powdered milk is like cocaine for baby hyenas. They will do anything to get some. So, and then that's a much less messy, stinky form of bait than the, the raw meat we were using in Lily's original trials. Yes, yeah, so all those details become quite important yeah. <laughs> over time. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, we just have a couple more, so I think we'll try to get to them uh, and then and then link to the social, which um, Teresa just put a link in the chat for those of you who didn't get an email with that link. Uh, so Jessica asks or says, great talk. Uh, do low ranking female hyenas or high ranking females have significantly higher cortisol levels, as has been shown in male baboons? If so, what does this tell you about how females experience physiological stress based on their rank? Yeah, interestingly, we do not see any rank related variation in either sex in um, in stress hormone concentrations. We do find that lactation is stressful for females. And so, um, you know, there is um, variation in, in cortisol levels with reproductive state, but no rank related variation. Strangely, we fully expected to find some as as yeah, as the, the person mentioned in monkeys or most animals, you see some sort of rank-related variation. Sometimes the high rankers have the high stress. Sometimes the low rankers have the high stress, but neither apparently here. I wonder if you'd see uh, a big change if there was a, a, dis a disturbance to the hierarchy, because I think oftentimes when the hierarchy is established, it's less stressful than when it's being formed. <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely right. You know, we've now had... Um, multiple clan fission, permanent clan fission events. And some of them are inspired by the death of an alpha female, for example. And then there's a lot of infighting amongst her daughters because the alpha position is supposed to fall to her youngest daughter. But if that daughter's say only 18 months or two years old, she's got older sisters who are way bigger and more powerful than she is. And so she may not be able to hold her rank and her sisters will fight with her to try and end up in that alpha position because it's definitely the place to be if you can possibly uh, be there. That seems so fascinating. The, the youngest daughter, you know, some of this, some of these things are just these cultural things are just so interesting. That's system. right. That's just, just just exactly as it is in in monkeys, because hyenas follow these two rules. There's basically the rules of maternal rank inheritance, where you're going to assume a rank right below your mom's, and also this rule of youngest ascendancy, where your mom takes your side if you're the baby in the you know the baby in the family. And this is most striking when young cubs first go out to start feeding at carcasses with their moms because, um, you know, the previous offspring runs up to the carcass and 
expects its mom to help it and she chases it away now because she's favoring the youngest one and so that's how the youngest animal comes to outrank the lower lower ranking sort of the older siblings that's that's fascinating i you know i can't help but uh, think about how this plays out in humans <laughs> that's right. um, Okay, so there's two more questions that are that kind of relate to uh, logistics and long term plans for your studies. So um, one question from Sue is how difficult is it to obtain permits to work in this really unique area? And do you do public outreach while you're in Kenya? Um, and then Oscar asks, what are the long term plans for your study? Is there kind of an end date or is it just just kind of a rolling project that keeps going? Good question. Well, um, the permitting has just in the last couple of years uh, become very different and much, much, much more difficult. It's never been hard until uh, 2019. Um, and, you know, we've made every effort to follow every rule and do everything that we're supposed to do to, to stay within the, the rules. But uh, Kenya Wildlife Service, which is the parastatal that, that oversees wildlife research in Kenya, um, has just changed all the rules and made it a lot more, made a lot more legal requirements. So. Um, if I were a grad student thinking about starting this project today, I wouldn't go there. It's just be too complicated, I'm afraid. And it's, it's tremendously expensive, as you can imagine, to fly me and various students to Kenya every year and pay for the cars that get beaten up on the terrible roads there and so forth. But um, So it's it's hard. And the, the, we have government officials at multiple levels. There's a federal government, there's a county government, and then there's the parastatal. And um, the federal government and the parastate are all pretty reasonable, but the county government has just decided they wanted individual research fees for a person like me to go up from $400 a year to $8,000 a year. And that's going to basically stop the research altogether unless we can compromise on that because no, no, no researchers out there have that kind of money. That's just crazy. Um, so yes, it's, uh, the permitting is a hassle and, and getting equipment there is a hassle because there's a lot of things that just aren't made in Kenya and you got to schlep them over there in your luggage or whatever. So that's that's a pain. Um, okay, and then the future of the project, that's pretty much up in the air right now. I'm planning to retire in 2023, and I have five former grad students, all of whom are doing postdocs now, who want say they want to take over this project because they've all lived and worked out there for extended periods. They all did their PhDs on hyenas. They love the animals. They love the site. They love our, our Kenyan employees and so forth. And um, um, if they can get faculty positions and get some money by the time I'm ready to retire, great. Otherwise, it, that will be the end date. We'll have a big yard sale and go home, I guess. But um, we do do a lot of outreach there, by the way. We, um, you know, we're, um, we've, we've constantly been working with the local communities and, and we teach a study abroad class. And one of the uh, requirements for every student enrolled in the class, we take 18 undergrads every summer over there. and. Um, teach them about behavioral ecology of African mammals. And we have a rule that they can bring one 50 pound bag for themselves and one 50 pound bag of school supplies for the local schools. And so we actually get a lot of stuff over there that way. And um, and we're starting actually movie nights um, in in the town of Talak, which abuts our study area. That's that rapidly urbanizing area I mentioned. And uh, so, yeah, we've been working with the local community a lot. And, you know, my Kenyan employees do all kinds of outreach. They schlep Maasai warriors from here to there and take people to the hospital and move cows around for people. They're just constantly trying to help just, you know, because we want to be, you know, light. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, thank you again, Kay, for, for sharing your research and all of these, sure. um, answering all these questions for us. Um, and I just want to thank Bill Lovejoy again for sponsoring this um, amazing series that, uh, that will continue in future years. So uh, there's a link to another Zoom session where we can socialize a little more. Uh, and so I hope that uh, many of you will be able to join us to know that a little bit of a challenging time of day, but uh, we hope to see you there. So I'm going to stay here in case there are questions, but I think Teresa maybe has already opened this the social. Is that, if that's right, Teresa, you can come on if, if that's wrong. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't quite yet. I'm just about to leave. I just, I just made you host. I'm about to leave. And so um, I'm going to go open it right now. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I guess, you know, while we transition over to that format, uh, if there are any other questions. Oh, well, Sue, Sue made a funny comment. So she says, uh, so will you pass the research baton to your youngest grad students? Ha ha. <laughs> Thanks for the intriguing talk. <laughs> yeah, these students, you know, I warned them. There's some colleagues of mine who run the Shark Bay uh, Australia 
uh, Bottlenose Dolphin Project. Um, you know, those folks all started off as really good friends who loved one another. And now I'm not sure they like each other so much anymore. And I've warned my students against that because they really do love and respect one another. And I want them to keep doing that. But we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> yeah, there's so many dynamics to running a field site and such a big program that is so expensive. Um, but hopefully, hopefully somebody manages to do it. Carry on your tradition. Yeah, I'm hoping so, too. If I figure out of five of them, one or two might make it. We'll see. <laughs> Okay, well, I think I'm, I'm guessing Teresa has that other session open. So I think uh, we could go ahead and, and transition over to that uh, when you're ready, Kay. Okay, sure. So I'll just leave this okay. one. And, um, you want to take a, a two minute break to <laughs> get a drink of water, then feel free. Okay. I'll see you in a minute. Thank you. <laughs> 